Hello YouTube, this is Mike. Welcome back to the channel. I'm just going to dust up some cobwebs here. Uh, again, I'm not doing uh, any live streams because the questions that I get, there's really the same answer to all of your questions, which is, and it's literally, it doesn't matter. If, if we're talking about recovering from the trauma of being in a romantic relationship with somebody who suffers from BPD or NPD, there's only one way out that I know of, and that is to do the four things. In my experience and in my observation, which is all that I have, everybody that I've seen who doesn't do all of the four things, they may get some relief, but um, it always comes back. It's, it's like you deal with the symptoms a little bit. Imagine having an illness that never really goes away. Maybe you can take some some kind of medication that masks the symptoms and you think, oh, I'm better, but it always comes back. This is what I've seen. I'm not suffering from that. In terms of the pain that I suffered from the relationship with my borderline ex, I am cured of that relationship. I still have my other issues. I still have all kinds of other, you know, core issues that don't go away. Life is still life. I still have childhood issues. That, that hasn't gone away, but doing the four things has completely cured me of the pain from that person. Do you want to never remember that person again? I, I mean, I have to think about her name. Um, I mean, I can't even, I, I, I forgot her name. I'm sure if I spend another 30 seconds, I'll figure it out, but I don't need to. Do you want to be in that state where you can't even remember their name? That you have no feelings, bad or good? You wish them well, but that was just something that happened. If you want that, you got to do the four things. Four things of this channel. It's the name of this channel. Four things that heal BPD and NPD abuse. Number one, you go no contact. That means make it impossible for them to contact you and that you never, ever allow contact from them ever again for the rest of your life. What's that? You're married, you're divorced, you have kids. Great. That's what... Uh, lawyers are for. You tell the lawyer, I don't want to have any direct contact. Any negotiation comes through you. That's what you pay them for. What's that? I don't want to pay for a lawyer. Well, too bad. You have been married to somebody that you now know has a very serious mental illness. And if you don't want to be in pain, this is what you got to do. So you go complete no contact. Number two, these first two are non-negotiable. Number two is you work all 12 steps of coda.org. That's the website. It's codependenceanonymous.org. Any other 12-step group is fine, but you got to work the 12 steps. I'm going to be talking to some about somebody in here who tried to lay some garbage on me. And it's not about, I worked the steps before. Great. You have to work the steps on every issue. You have an issue now with somebody you've been in a relationship with. You've got to work the, the 12 steps on that. What's that? You don't like the meetings? You don't like the people? Right. That's where sick people go is to get better. It's not about the people. It's about working the steps. What's that? There's no code of meetings in your hometown or in your country? Not a problem. You're on here watching this, which means that you have access to internet, which means you can go to a Zoom meeting. Go to coda.org and go to a Zoom meeting. Get a sponsor. Work the steps. If you don't, I have no sympathy for you. There's the answer. It doesn't cost you anything. You got nothing to lose except your pain. Number three, work with a psychologist. You don't have the money for a psychologist. Okay, so you can shelve that until you can afford it. 12 steps in psychology and in, in my experience are, you know, really good. Gives you very strong immunity. Number four uh, is some kind of meditative practice, which is really just step 11. And so really the only thing you have to do is step one and step two. And those are the ones that people falter on the most. A lot of people want to do number three, or number four, but they don't want to do one or two. And you have to do one or two absolutely, completely, totally, without, you know, not partially or, or kind of. Otherwise, I can't guarantee that you'll feel any better. All right, so let's uh, brush off some cobwebs here and take a look at some of the comments. So here was an interesting comment somebody left says, 
So what would it look like if you wanted to make things work? Make them wait, make them try. Boy, um, that right there is, um, forgive me, but that is the very, let me just say that I had that same desire. <laughs> I felt exactly the same. I had the same question. And boy, what a delusion. You're in, you're in a state of delusion. Um, what does it look like if you wanted to make things work? Are you saying you didn't want to make it work? Of course you did. You wanted to make it work. And it's not working. So what would it look like if you wanted to make things work? Exactly the way it is with you right now. Whatever your situation is, you're trying to make it work. It obviously isn't working. So, uh, and, you know, I, I uh, responded and I said, what makes you think that everyone here, including me, hasn't tried to make it work? This kind of a question, so what would it look like if I tried to make things work? Um, w it could be connected to something we've all experienced, which is, yeah, okay, that's, that's okay for you. Yeah, you're with a borderline and your relationship is all screwed up, but you don't understand. I'm different. Our relationship is different. It's not. If you want to know what it looks like when you try and make it work with an untreated, undiagnosed and or toxic borderline, take a look at every single person on here who keeps coming back. It, uh, it never works. And the idea of making them wait, what, you're like you're going to make a borderline do anything? Make them try? I mean, this shows that you don't understand that they have a mental illness. And let's be very clear. If you're with somebody who has... BPD or NPD, they have a personality disorder. There's a severe mental illness going on. They are not in the same realm of reality as you. And for those of you who are borderline, you don't like what I just said, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Um, if you. If everything you hear me say about borderlines doesn't apply to you, then you don't have BPD. And if you don't have BPD, there's no reason for you to be trolling this channel um, because that's obviously not your problem. If you do have BPD, there are some things that are generally true about anybody who has BPD. And that happens to be, for, in terms of relationships, called splitting. When you get so uh, fearful and you get so paranoid that you lash out and you destroy a relationship with somebody who hasn't done anything wrong. Now, if you are somebody who has BPD, you do that. If you don't do that, guess what? You don't have BPD. What's that? You went to your therapist and your therapist said, no, absolutely, you do have BPD. Then these are things that you do and you're not aware of it. And then we go back into the whole idea of this is a personality disorder. You're with somebody, you think they make sense. You're, you're trying to be rational with them doesn't work. If you can get it into your head that you're with somebody that is incapable of giving you what you want, in my experience, then you'll have a better chance of you know, doing the work and, and healing. Okay, moving on. Uh, somebody says, uh, okay, that's, that's different. Um, I'm looking for the things that I can help people with. Be, I appreciate the positive comments. So that was a positive comment. I thank you for that. And here's a borderline who comes on here and says, this leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Painting an entire mental illness in this light as being evil and fake to be in a relationship sucks. I have BPD and this isn't true. This is in response to probably my most, um, my most popular video on this channel, which is dating a borderline, your relationship is not what you think. Now, I guarantee you, I did not say that uh, borderlines were evil. I've never said that. Let me tell you why. If somebody is evil, it means that they are planning to do you harm. It means that they know that the actions they are doing are hurtful to you and that they have the ability to do something different. That's an evil person. An evil deed is when you know you're harming somebody out of selfishness. That means if somebody is evil, it means that they're rational. What does that mean? It means that there's hope that you can confront them on their evil deeds and with rationality, which means knowing objective reality, 
you can show them objective reality and either force them, like, you know, here's the law. If you don't do it, you'll go to jail. Or, you know, if you, you know, oh, my God, I didn't realize that was such a horrible thing. I realized I was a bad person now. I won't do it. That's what's behind the belief that somebody is evil. And I'm not saying they're evil. I'm saying that they're mentally ill. That doesn't mean that they can't have, you know, bouts of having evil thoughts and evil intentions. It means that they really don't understand what they're doing and that they don't have any control over it and no rationality. When they're in there, when they're splitting and when they're, you know, operating out of, you know, whatever their dysfunction is, they are not in a rational state. They are in a psychotic state. So there's a difference between psychosis and neurosis. If you're watching this channel because you are a partner or an ex-partner of a borderline or a narcissist, it means that you are neurotic. What does that mean? It means that you know what objective reality is. It means that you remember who you were yesterday, you know who you are today, you'll know who you are tomorrow, you'll remember this conversation, you'll be able to make plans and follow through, you have an identity, you have the ability to make conscious decisions based on your relationship with objective reality, but you don't always like it. You're feeling crazy, you're feeling neurotic because you're with somebody who is not functioning rationally. They are not treating you in a way that uh, is part of the rational rules of how people are supposed to operate. You don't like it. So neurosis is you know what reality is, but you don't like it. Those of you that don't want to admit that your partner has a mental illness that they cannot, they are incapable. There is nothing you will ever be able to do to get them to love you. You don't like that. There's a part of you that knows that, but you're addicted to the idea that maybe tomorrow, maybe if I do this, maybe if I love them just enough, maybe if I walk up to Chris Rock and smack him in the mouth in front of the whole world, then, then maybe she'll love me. That's neurosis. Psychosis is... When, here, another, I just, you know, I can't help it. It's just so, it's such a perfect example. One of the latest things that have come up of the videos of Chris, this is, uh, sorry, not Chris Rock, Will Smith, Red Table Talk, him telling the world that um, he, when his wife turned 37, he started plans for her 40th birthday, three years in advance. He started planning the most amazing birthday party ever. Celebrity singers. I mean, I can't even imagine how many tens of thousands of dollars he spent to create this. Her response to that 40th birthday party was that she was disgusted at this display of his ego. That's psychosis. That's when somebody gives you something uh, and loves you unconditionally, and your response is to is to call them horrible names and to judge them for something that they didn't do. So that's psychotic. Psychosis versus neurosis. Now, that in itself, I have to tell you, that there is nothing about her response that is even the closest bit um, defendable in terms of be in a relationship. The proper response to somebody who does that when you spend three years, tens of thousands of dollars getting their, get their perfect, um, you know, uh, um, uh, celebrity to come and sing. If the response is anything other than, oh my God, thank you so much for this incredibly loving gift that you've given to me. Any other response is insane. The only response to that is, um, this can't work. <laughs> I'm out of here. See you later. That's the only response to that. Any other response of she can't help it, or she's been through a lot, or she's in a lot of pain, or that's just the way she is, or maybe if I help her understand, or maybe if we have more red table talks, or maybe if we go to a therapist. No, you have to. The only logical, sane response to something like that is to leave. Because the only 
logical sane reaction to that is this person is incapable of being loved and loving in return. I'm not going to get what I want. So if you're a borderline, um, I've never called you evil and I've never called you fake. In fact, you mean what you say. When you say you love somebody and it's the most amazing relationship and they're your favorite person, you mean it when you say it. The problem is if you have this particular uh, personality disorder, then you don't have an ability to follow through and be consistent. If you did, you wouldn't have BPD. Of course, there's a sliding scale, but if it goes so far that the person is able to monitor their feelings, and if they feel like, oh my God, this person just spent tens of thousands of dollars in three years, and there's Mary J. Blige, and you know what? I'm really wanting to run away, but that would be so crazy because look at what a loving thing it is. That's on the realm of neurosis, and that's okay. You can work with that. Take that to therapy. But when somebody responds like that, I, that was the most disgusting display of your ego, um, you just have to go, all right, we're in two different universes and this isn't going to work. There's nothing you're going to be able to do. Uh, now, here's a really great question. Somebody asks, in your life, and oh, this is a, another borderline. Here we go, another borderline. Um, in your life and borderline tendencies, can you not put four and six together to get ten? You are the one you cannot see. The actions and behavior wait, wait, you, the actions and behavior that you project, you're the common denominator, my friend. Deny it, I dare you. So and then I respond, so you're a person with BPD? No response. This is obviously a borderline. The only people who talk like that to me are borderlines. And this is what we call gaslighting. Um, what's interesting is that every time a borderline accuses me of uh, stigmatizing them, like in the, the most recent one, this person accused me of saying that borderlines were evil and that they were fake. And if you spend time on my channel, not only do I never say that, in fact, I go to bat and I defend borderlines who are accused of being evil and fake. So, you know, there's a good example. The borderline is going to put words into my mouth that I never said, thoughts or intentions that I never thought. And um, in this case, this person is, you know, saying that it's my fault. So what's interesting about that is that there's, what, zero empathy. So let's imagine... Some a borderline comes onto my channel. They've been in therapy for a while. They know that they're an individual. They know that they're not their mental illness. They can separate between the two. They may have a personal reaction to my feelings when I talk about how horrifically damaged I was by the very hurtful, destructive, and psychopathic behavior of my borderline ex. If they're in some recovery, I don't know what feelings they're going to have, but they're going to have some compassion. And they're going to know that they're not my borderline ex. And they're going to know that they are different from another borderline. But they're going to know that they have something in common. They're going to know that they either have done that in the past or that they still do that or that they at the very least feel the tendency to do that. And then on top of that, if they have compassion, if they have empathy, they're going to go, and that would be really horrible to live through. And the only response you can give to somebody who's been through that, instead of taking it personally and feeling, uh, uh, and, and feeling threatened by that, the only real response is to say, I'm really sorry that that person did that to you. Anything else is abusive. So here I am being abused by somebody. Um, because what is this channel about? This channel is about helping people who have been damaged by hurtful people. Borderlines have been damaged by hurtful people. And so at the very least, they should be able to understand that what we've gone through is the same thing they've gone through and to have compassion and empathy. And that compassion and empathy then says, you know what, I don't want to do this to somebody else. But it is a mental illness, and one of the things about the mental illness is that it tells you that you don't have it. It does exactly this. It demonizes the victim. 
So she's victim blaming me, or he, I think it's a he, victim blaming me, saying, can't you put four and six together? You're the one you cannot see. In other words, it's my fault. According to them, it's my fault that all those things happened to me. And so uh, by association, everybody else who's ever been hurt or damaged, it's your fault. Um, you're the common denominator, my friend. Well, if that were the case, then that would mean every single relationship I've ever been in would be the same because if I'm the common denominator, then that would mean that every single woman would treat me that way. And that's not the case. I have been treated so incredibly well by uh, you know, a lot of different women. I've been in some destructive relationships, but I've never had the experience, anything even close than what happened when I was with the borderline. Not even close. So this is called gaslighting, and this is called uh, projection. This is called victim blaming, and it's what a borderline does. Now, I don't know this person. They may be in therapy, maybe they're not. And the thing, just because a borderline's in therapy, in case you think, well, if I just get my borderline some counseling, it takes, uh, on average, what I've heard, it takes about 10 years of intense therapy honest desire on the part of the um, the patient to heal before they have the ability to control their symptoms. Their borderline uh, reactions never go away. Their splitting never goes away. But having the ability to act lovingly regardless of your feelings, that's a sign of health. And as long as the person that you're with can act lovingly, no matter what they feel, that's the only thing that matters. So I don't know if you find somebody that's been in therapy for a long enough time and they're borderline and they can, they can uh, take responsibility, uh, I wish you all the best. I don't think I would take that risk. They'd really have to prove it to me and I don't know how they could <laughs> based on my experience, but anyway. Uh, let's see, what else? Somebody's thanking me for the four things. Here's a really great question. Somebody asks, do you think on some level narcissism is related to the ability rather than the lack thereof to give in a relationship versus codependency, which is a sickness related to one's lack of an ability to receive while also giving too much? Well, on the surface, that's what it looks like, right? So the narcissist can't According to this model, the narcissist can't give love and the codependent can't take love. Unfortunately, um, that's true for both. Codependence and uh, narcissistic personality disorders, which also includes BPD, um, they're caused by the same thing. But um, there's a, you know, there's a, a sliding scale. So we talked about uh, psychosis versus neurosis, but the core is the same. Both people with NPD, people with BPD, and just non-disordered codependents all suffer from the same problem, which is codependence. These are all various, uh, various forms of codependence. Now, the label codependent is usually only given to the non-personality disordered person who is on paper on the receiving end of the abuse. But the truth is that they're, they both operate from the same core issue. And the same core issue is that there was some neglect and or some abuse and or some confusion uh, when they were children, which the end result was that they got the message that um, you're only lovable based on what you do, not who you are. In the, uh, when you go to the extreme, you end up with the NPD and the BPD. And their codependence is so extreme that they uh, do not believe that there's anything that they can do to be loved, which is why they lash out when you love them. When you love them, they uh, and it's you know they and you give to them. That doesn't have to be that. It could be completely have nothing to do with what you did. It could just happen within them because they're starting to have loving feelings. 
They're starting to feel vulnerable. And they never get to that conscious state of having that feeling. It's just that begins to happen. And then their fear of abandonment and or their fear of engulfment kicks in and it feels like it's killing them. And so the only thing they know how to do is to destroy what they believe is the cause of their uh, feelings, which is you. So they lash out at you and uh, they destroy the relationship in an attempt to preserve their own life. And that's called, you know, that's, that's, a, that's not a sane delusion. Especially like when you've spent three years giving somebody the best, you know, 40. Uh, and I imagine he did that because he was, she was worried about turning 40. He probably did that as the most loving act he could to somebody that he cared about. <laughs> what did she do? She said that was the most disgusting act of ego I've ever seen. It was just, that's craziness. That's nuts. There's nothing, nothing sane about that. But that is a typical borderline. A borderline would do that. A narcissist would do that. I haven't decided whether or not uh, Jada Smith is borderline or narcissist or both. But uh, anyway, so um, do I think on some level narcissism uh, is about uh, not giving and that codependency is about not being able to receive? No, that's the symptoms. That's the way the symptoms play it out because there has to be a dynamic. So that's how the dynamic plays it out. But uh, the, the narcissist, the borderline and the codependent all suffer from the same issue, which is they believe that their value is based on what they do, not who they are. It's based on how you look, based on how much money you have. It's based on what you say, what you do. As you know, if you're with a borderline or a narcissist, what they told you you had to do yesterday to be the, the perfect person, uh, you do that same thing the next day, and it's the worst possible thing you could have ever done. Um, they're constantly telling you how you need to change, what you need to do. They're telling you what's wrong with you. They blame everything on you. Everything is your fault. And uh, so the message is, it's not about you. They don't love you for who you are. Again, Will Smith, Jada Pinkett, her quote, when she met Will Smith, she said to herself, I think this guy has everything I need. What does that mean? It means on an energetic level, he picked up on that, which means that his job is to give her what she needs in order to get her love. But there's all kinds of different ways to respond. You can also respond when you meet somebody you fall in love with. Your first response is, could be, oh my God, I really believe I can have a connection with this person. Oh my God, I really think this person can love me for who I am. Oh my God, I can feel this person will allow me to love them and they'll love me back. We have so much in common. Those are all a bunch of different responses. The response, oh my God, I think he has everything I need. There's no love on the, that person's end. But when you hear that, and I remember hearing that. Now I say it to you now and you go, oh my God, that sounds horrible. But... When you're in it and you're with a very, you know, in the case of me, you know, heterosexual male, on the other end is this very beautiful, sexy, seductive woman who's looking at you and her, and her uh, irises are dilating and she's, you know, touching you and she's really sexy and beautiful. And she says, you have everything I need. Then your ego goes through the roof. Oh, my God, finally, I'm enough. Somebody, she's going to love me. It will always be like this. I will always be able to meet all of her needs. And because that's where I get my worth, she'll continuously love me. But true love is you accept the person for who they are, not for what they do. And um, when you're in a relationship where you are doing for somebody because you want to, because it makes you feel good to see them happy, and they, in return, are loving you for who you are, they appreciate what you give and uh, they, you know, that doesn't make them want to give back to you. They want to give back to you because they like what they see. They like who you are. That's love. Yeah, that's a perfection standard, but I've experienced it. It's a real thing. It can really happen. 
looking at somebody and saying, I think this person can give me everything I need. That's about as codependent as it gets. Because from the perspective of the narcissist or the borderline, they don't have anything. So somebody, you know, and make no mistake, when they're with you, they are feeding off of your identity. They have no identity. So they outsource it, as Sam Vaknin, I believe he said that. They outsource their identity to you. And as long as you are being yourself and empowered with yourself, they can siphon off of your identity. Now, what's that, what's that going to do? That's going to drain you. It's also not going to work. I mean, it's a nice idea. I'll just let them. They have everything that I need. They'll give me my identity. It's a nice idea, but it doesn't work. They project on you and they think it's working in the beginning, which is why in the beginning they love bomb you and they idealize you and they you're perfect. You can't do any wrong and you feel safe, but it's all projection. In other words, it's a fantasy. They are they are projecting onto you qualities and feelings and behavior that they really want you to have for them. And that will fade. I mean, that fantasy, because it's not real. It's a delusion. The projection is a delusion. They see you differently than you are. They see you the way that they want you to be. And that delusion will fade. And when it does, you're the one that screwed up. You disappointed them. I even I, I remember hearing a borderline on this channel once saying, uh, you know, explaining why it's not her fault. Because when I get disappointed, and that's what it means. It sounds like something she heard in therapy and then the therapist. And, you know, when somebody disappoints you, you can't respond like this. So they go, oh, yeah, it's not my fault. It's that you disappointed me. And guaranteed you will. Because they're going to they're going to project onto you a perfection you don't have. And then um, when that fades, they're going to see that you're not what they thought. Or worse yet, they're going to project onto you some evil that you don't possess. Either way, you're going to disappoint them. And then they're going to punish you for that. So it's a, you know, we've talked about that before. It's a, it's a, a pendulum and the pendulum swings. It never stops. The pendulum is always swinging. And in fact, the pendulum, you know, creates more motion. It starts like this and the more it swings, that gets more strength. And um, that's never going to stop. That's the nature of this. And the pendulum will swing between idealization and devaluation. Devaluation means like slashing your tires. That's devaluation. Slashing your tires, telling you that they hate you, that you're the most evil person that's ever existed. Um, when you spend tens of thousands of dollars in three years putting together the best 40th birthday party for your wife and she accuses you of having a horrific ego and what a disgusting display of ego it was. You know, that's that's a very strong swing in the wrong direction. Anyway. So do I? Th so the bottom line is uh, they're all codependent, which means they have an external locus of control, which means that the codependent, the person who doesn't have the disorder, who is loving and giving and trying to be perfect so that they will be loved, they don't have a um, uh, they don't have an internal locus of control. They have an external locus of control, which means somebody outside of them has the ability to affect their self-worth. So let's make a difference. You know, being hurt, somebody hurts your feelings, that doesn't mean that you don't have self-worth. That's a normal reaction. But if you have self-worth, which means you have a strong individuated identity, somebody hurts you, it hurts you, and you then find the strength within yourself and you go, wow, I honestly didn't deserve that. That's horrible. I was really hurt, but I know who I am. If you don't have an internal locus of control, then when somebody says, I can't believe that you, you know, that was such a horrific display of ego, then you go, oh my God, I did it wrong. I, I wasn't good enough because you don't have enough love within yourself. Maybe next time. Maybe if I, if I finally get it perfect, they'll finally love me. In other words, I'm not perfect the way that I am. I'm only perfect when I do exactly what it is that they need. That's the experience of the codependent, but it comes from 
a lack of identity, and it comes from the codependent part, comes from uh, a selfish need for somebody to fix you. Even though you're the one doing the fixing, you're the one fixing them, your fix comes from, oh, I finally did it, I finally fixed them, I'm a good person. You're wanting them to fix you. What you really want, let's be honest, if you're a codependent, you really honestly believe if you can find that one little screw and put it back into place, then your love doll will function perfectly and love you perfectly. And then you can finally bask in their unconditional, unceasing love, which is what you wanted from the beginning. Even though you tell yourself, what I do is I give and I give and I know how to give, but I don't know how to, re know how to receive love. The truth is the only reason you give is because you want them to love you and or get your narcissistic fix of feeling the worth. And it's a sad, it's a very sad thing that your worth comes from doing something for somebody else. So it's very selfish. And it's the same thing. On their end, um, it's the same thing. They have an external locus of control. And in the case of the borderline, they their love bombing is codependent, extremely codependent, trying to be perfect so that you will love them because they don't have any worth within themselves. Then when you do love them, because they're very good at it, they, you know, they believe it and they feel it and they're very good at it, 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 it elicits a love response in you. When you do respond and it actually hits home and um, they really feel it, then they become frightened of being that vulnerable. They're afraid you're gonna leave them, which then instantly goes into feelings of uh, fear of enmeshment, which then triggers their psychopathic need to uh, psychologically murder you to get rid of the threat. But it comes from the same place. Narcissists, same thing. They create a false reality and they're, they're stuck in their false reality because they have no self, because they're completely unlovable. There's nothing about them in their mind. They're on the furthest end of the spectrum. There's nothing about them that is, in their mind, in the slightest bit worthy of love. And so they create a false person that they try and be, which is constantly falling apart. And it's, you know, you're not worshiping them. That's their projection. They hate themselves, so they create the opposite of that, which is, no, I'm perfect, worship me. You don't worship them perfectly. You don't, you don't hold up that, that false, perfect person because nobody can. It's impossible. And because you fail at that, they have to destroy you. But uh, the codependent, the borderline, the narcissist all suffer from the same thing, which is selfish, narcissistic need to be perfect and to be loved um, and to manipulate somebody to love them unconditionally. So you make it sound like uh, the codependent has an inability to receive love. That's exactly what's going on with the borderline, right? Because when you do love them, what happens? They destroy you. So you have the same problem that they do. You're just playing it out in a different way. Same thing true with the narcissist. So they all suffer from the inability to receive love. They also suffer from um, the inability to give because uh, you don't see it now. <laughs> That's a codependent. You're not giving of yourself because you don't believe that you have any value within yourself. So you try and be perfect. So anyway, that didn't, that didn't come out as... Uh, neat as I wanted it to, but the bottom line is, is that you are operating from narcissistic selfishness as well. And this is what the fourth step is all about. When you look at your resentments and uh, your expectations, you realize you wanted something from them uh, and you really weren't thinking about honestly giving to them. Because look, everybody listening to me, if you think that you love your borderline or your narcissist unconditionally, Great. Now that you know that they have a personality disorder, the kindest thing you can do is walk away. And you have tremendous difficulty doing that for two reasons at least. One is the thought of, of severing the addiction, which is you're addicted not to what they give you, but to the hope that someday they will. You're addicted to the hope that someday you'll finally be loved. You'll finally, what will happen is that you'll finally get your mom and dad's love. 
You're, it's never happened. It hasn't happened with them, but you are addicted to the hope that it will. You don't want to break that addiction. And the second one is that um, you can't tolerate the guilt of not, you honestly believe that you're so powerful that if you weren't there to pick up the pieces for them and narcissistically meet their demands, meet their narcissistic demands, then you're damaging them. When you're in the delusion, they're damaged already and there's nothing you can do to fix them. Everything you do to try and help them only makes them more dependent on you. So they're dependent also. They're dependent on the narcissistic supply that you give them, which never satisfies them. So um, if you really loved them unconditionally, you would go, wow, I'm not helping this person. I really want their love. I really want them to be loved, but that's not going to happen. The kindest thing I can do is say, I think you should go see a therapist. I can't stay. It's not working. Bye-bye. But you're not going to do that unless you're doing the four things because you're selfish. It is selfishness. And when you can see that, I'm not, you don't, do you see any judgment? I'm obviously talking about myself because I've been there. So I'm not judging it. It's just the reality of it. So the thing that narcissists, borderlines, and codependents all have in common is narcissistic selfishness. That's the one thing that bonds them together. It comes from the same root, lack of identity. Your worth comes from uh, what you do, not who you are. What else? Here's another borderline shows up. So this is three borderlines. This is disgusting, they say. I don't even have BPD. You are speaking like all things you say are facts and that everyone apparently has the same experience. Ugh. So, uh, you're not a borderline. What are you doing on this channel? I mean, if you're, you're attacking me, uh, and you're, you're attacking me, according to you, for, I guess, maligning borderlines. So if you're not a borderline, what are you doing here? The only reason that you'd be here is that you're in some kind of romantic, well, some kind of relationship with a borderline, and that you've codependently decided to defend them. So this is disgusting. So what do you, what's disgusting? My experience? Other people's experiences. Again, one of the things that, that borderlines and narcissists like to do is they try to isolate you. So if you've noticed, the people who leave these, uh, these critical messages at me, which they always make personal, you know, they, it's disgusting. You know, they don't, you know, I'm, it's disgusting. I'm disgusting. They make it very personal. It's an attack meant to devalue me. And they act as though I am saying something completely out of the norm and that nobody else has the same experience as me. And that's an attempt to isolate me. This is, an, this is what abusers do. They isolate you and then they begin to attack and devalue you so that you have to be on the defensive and then the point is to get them to love you. So the, what this person wants to do is they want to devalue me to such a degree that I will change my belief or change what I say in the hopes to get their love and approval. I mean, it's not it's going to work. This is just a tactic. And codependents are extremely abusive. So assuming this person is not a BPD, and if I'm accurate, then that means we're, we're dealing with a codependent. Somebody who, let's say this person, I don't know, I don't know yet, but it wouldn't, it would definitely wouldn't surprise me if, if they were to get honest. The other thing is um, codependents rarely get honest. They rarely, they rarely talk from themselves. They do the same thing that borderlines do because borderlines are codependents. They make it about you. They talk about you, what you're doing. You know, like the other one, the, the one borderline said um, that, you know, uh, can't you see that this is, I remember the exact words, can't you see that this is your problem, that you're the common denominator, you're the one that did this? You know, why can't you look at yourself? The person says nothing about themselves. They, they make it all about you. And they isolate you. So the, the, uh, the assumption here in this, this is disgusting. I don't even have BPD. You're speaking like all the things you say are facts and that everyone apparently has the same experience. That's right. At least that last part. Everybody who's damaged by a, a narcissistic person 
has this same experience. They're devalued and destroyed. That's right. And how is it you don't see that? This is lack of empathy. This is a codependent who doesn't have any empathy because they're not even spending time looking at all the comments of all the people who are sharing their same experience as me. All the people who are thanking me. Thank you so much for sharing about the four things. My life is so much better. I'm healing. And what she did to me, what he did to me. So no empathy for anybody. Certainly not for me. And uh, so this is a tactic. So I don't know who it is. And I said, you don't have BPD. You know, you know be honest. I didn't say that, but... You know, why don't you share with us your connection? Nobody comes onto this channel unless you've either been damaged or you are a borderline and you're, you know, whatever reason, either you want to get better or you're feeling guilty or who knows what. But assuming this person is right and they don't have BPD, what are you doing here? The only other, other reason, so this either is a borderline or it's somebody who's in a relationship with a borderline and they're looking for a way to make it work. And then they see my video, Dating a Borderline. Your relationship is not what you think. And then I basically destroy the illusion, which is what is the main thing I say in that video is that what you're having a relationship with is not that person. It is with your fantasy of where you hope it can go. And the point of that video is to say, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but your hope will never be realized because these people can't give you what you want. So if you're wrapped up in that fantasy and you're desperately hoping that you're going to make it work with this borderline, and um, I come along and say, no, that's first off, it's not happening. They don't love you. You don't love them. It's counter projection. You're projecting onto them. They're projecting onto you and they have a mental illness, they're incapable of giving you what you want. I'm sorry, but those are the facts. They have a mental illness. You will never be able to get them to love you. If you're addicted to the hope that someday I will get them to love me and my love will be perfect and I'll finally be loved and seen for who I am and I destroy that, then you have to defend that delusion by attacking me. And uh, by extension, anybody else who has the same experience. Apparently, everyone has the same experience. Yes. Unless they're not a borderline. If, they, if not, then they're not a borderline. And or they've been in therapy for 10 years. Outside of that, if they have the diagnosis of BPD, then they will by definition because it's a symptom. BPD is, is, is diagnosed by symptoms, not their internal feelings. If they have the same internal feelings and they split inside, but they have the ability to go, you know what, that's going to be hurtful to that person. I'm going to do the opposite and I'm going to be loving to them instead. And you act lovingly or you talk through your feelings in a way that makes people want to be able to love you and you're able to handle it. Then you don't have BPD. Why? Because you're not acting symptomatically. But if you have those symptoms, then you have the diagnosis. So yes. Every single person with borderline personality disorder splits, uh, vacillates between idealization and devaluation. They don't like, you know, it would be great. Every, everyone wants to find the borderline that's stuck in idealization mode. That, you know, they're broken and, the, and the, the pendulum got stuck and is only stuck in the idealization mode. Everybody wants that. But that's not BPD. BPD goes from one to the other. And if you have that diagnosis, it means that's what happens. That's the, the symptoms that you have. And if you don't have those symptoms, then you're cured or you've whatever. So, yep. Apparently, everyone has the same experience. Ugh. Yep, that's right. Um... Okay, this guy's, uh, he, he, <laughs> anyway, I, I won't respond to that one. Um, let's see, is this one worth responding to? A uh, short thing I'm going to get into, a person describes the exact same thing we all go through. Again, this is the thing, everybody, you know, the reason why people come on here and they write these huge paragraphs 
talking about their experience and what their borderline did to them is because they've been isolated. So they finally feel like they found a place where it's safe to talk about it. And so they're talking about it. But the truth is your experience is exactly like everybody else. The only thing that's changed is the minor details, the sex of the person, the name of the person, you know, whether it happened in your house or in a restaurant or how the length of time it doesn't matter. But the exact same thing is the same. You were seduced by the love bombing and then you were destroyed by the devaluation and or they split on you and they discarded you and they hoovered you back and it's the same thing it happens the same in every relationship you're not unique um, this person said um, not sure how to move on because I thought we will be forever together even with her BPD diagnosis. Well, it means you don't understand the BPD diagnosis. BPD diagnosis means she's incapable. She's incapable of, of not doing those things. I'm assuming she hasn't been in therapy for, you know, 10 years or more. She's been in for less than 10 years. So get out. That's your only hope. Otherwise, it'll you aren't helping them because you are their fix. You know, they're trying to get off of heroin and you are a giant walking you know, uh, poppy seed. Um, so yeah, the, the idea that you could stay with them forever, even though they had BPD means you don't understand what BPD is and you have to get over that delusion that, you know, you're going to be the one to help them through, but you're the problem because you're their addiction. Uh, I feel it goes on to say, I feel incredibly guilty. Maybe I could have done something different to save it. No, that if you could do something different to save it, that would mean they didn't have BPD. So again, you don't understand BPD. So you don't know what to do. I've told you exactly what to do. And I guarantee you, if you do the four things, whatever questions you have will be answered or will become irrelevant. And the pain, I guarantee you, will go away. You will be cured of the pain of that person. How long? I can't say, but you have to do the work. If you're not willing to do the work, it won't happen. Um, so I told you that there was somebody that I, um, I gave a little excoriation to, uh, this person says after, you know, sharing again, same thing, she did this, she did this and giving the specifics and we roll our eyes because we don't care. We've all been through it. Your specific doesn't make you any different than anybody else. Yes. She was horrible to you because she has borderline personality disorder and you've been traumatized, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Same as everybody else on here. Welcome. We don't judge you for that. Uh, but this person says that they, um, uh, when I say do the four things and you can heal, part of that means work the 12 steps of CODA. And I make it clear. I don't care if you work the 12 steps of CODA, AA, NA, Gambling Anonymous, Sex Anonymous. I don't care. The steps are the same. What's most important is to do all 12 steps with a sponsor about that particular issue. So this person says they're six years sober in AA and the steps are the same as CODA, but it's not that simple, meaning just work the steps of CODA and you'll be free of the pain. It's not that simple, at least for me. For, for me, the issue is PTSD and the feeling of addiction to that person. That's exactly the same experience of everybody else here. So you've been in AA long enough. You've heard people say you're not unique. You've heard the term terminal uniqueness. So you're just now uh, attributing that same victim mentality, terminal uniqueness to this. Now, the 12 steps, the way they work is you work all 12 steps generally about your issue but then you're going to have to work them specifically over specific things. The fourth step is the key. And the fourth step is every time you have a resentment, which means somebody doesn't do what you want. You are having PTSD. You are having addiction to that person, which means they're not doing what you want. So I already know that you haven't worked the fourth step on this person. So stop trying to, you know, BS me because it's not going to work. So do the work and stop giving yourself excuses why you're different from everybody else. You're no different from anybody else on here. Anybody else who does the four things and works that fourth step 
the resentments and the expectations that you had on that borderline, how they hurt you, how they devalued you, and how you didn't get what you want from them. When you find out what happens when you go through that whole process of working the four columns of the four step, fourth step, you'll, you'll get healed. It's that simple. You don't want to do the work, you won't heal. You want to tell me that you're different and you don't need to do the work? Um, please enjoy your pain. I'm not going to co-sign it for you. And then last but not least, we have a codependent who's in denial. So he says, he, again, nobody comes on my channel unless they've been damaged by a borderline. If you haven't been damaged by a borderline, you don't come onto my channel. So this person writes three different comments on three different videos, which means he's watching one video, then another one, then another one. So if you really think that what I'm talking about doesn't make any sense and you don't relate, then after a couple of minutes, you're just going to go somewhere else. You're not going to watch three separate videos. This person says, to me, again, codependence can be some of the most destructive, uh, um, devaluing people there are in order to protect their codependence. This person says, don't you think she dumped you because you showed your vulnerability? Yeah. And? Goes on to say, you showed your tears. So like almost every woman, she lost trust in you as a man and she decided to destroy the object. It is not even a borderline behavior. It is every woman behavior. Oh, really? I bet every woman would like to know about that. You showed your weakness. She had only contempt. What did you expect? I'm not saying it is nice, but this is how woman lizard brain operates. If she cannot trust you as a masculine leader, she will dump you. Nothing BPD about that. Normal women lizard brain behavior. Not nice, but normal. So if what you're saying is true, then um, you're just talking about all women. All women devalue men who show their honest feelings. Uh, all women will uh, disrespect, devalue, and uh, discard you for sharing your you're the strength for showing the strength to share your honest feelings. So what that means is that you think women are inferior. You think that they're not just border. I mean, I'm saying, look, there's a difference. Their borderlines have a mental illness. They can't help it because they have a mental illness. You're saying all women have this mental illness. You're saying that all women are inferior to you, in, in which case, why are you even with them? This is codependence. Now, the, the delusion this person has is they want you to believe, because there's a couple other comments which I won't get into. This person wants you to believe that they are very strong. And he says later, you know, um, if you would be a bad boy with avoidant attachment style, she would chase you and in her eyes it would be love. Um, that's possible because borderlines love, uh, they love narcissists. But they always end up destroying the narcissist as well. So what you're saying is true in the beginning. But the fact that you say that shows me that you are extremely codependent. Because in your mind, you never, you're never able to be yourself with a woman. Because they're all uh, inferior animal lizard brains. And they, they can't tolerate any real feelings from a man. They're really horrible. You paint them to be these really horrible creatures. And so your strategy is to pretend that you're a narcissistic, abusive, emotionally unavailable person. And if you do that, according to you, you will be able to manipulate them into chasing after you and loving you. And as long as you keep that narcissistic distance from them, according to you, they'll love you. And of course, that's not true. That's not how it works. But what that means is that you are the epitome of the most extreme codependent, which means that you consciously know that you are unworthy of their love, that your essence, that your feelings are not enough. And that the only way that you can be loved is if you pretend 
to not have any feelings. And if you manipulate them a certain way, then they'll love you. And I have to say that is the ultimate in codependence. So he says at the end, to be honest, codependents are not a challenge for women. Why women? Why would a woman like to stay with a codependent? This is called projection. You're trying to say, I'm not a codependent. You are. Why would a woman want to be with you, you weak, simpering little... No woman's going to want that. I'm not like that. I'm tough. And I'm, I'm macho and I don't have any feelings. In fact, I'm so impervious that... I just manipulate women and string them along and it works. And I know that's a lie. I know that they destroy you. I know that you've been in multiple relationships. I'm willing to bet your mom didn't love you. That's a sad thing. And that she taught you that you had to be tough and have no feelings and abuse women, at least in the sense of, if not in outright ways, but you have to abuse them by... Um, pretending to not have any feelings and to never give to them and not be emotionally available and uh, show up late and not give them any gifts and uh, not share your honest feelings. And that manipulation and that abuse will make them chase after you. And that to you is love. And that is the definition of codependence. That's extreme toxic codependence. And this is a toxic, abusive, codependent person. You're acting just like a narcissist. Uh, if you're not a narcissist, you're pretending to be one. And what's the difference? Narcissism is a behavior. Um, so you're saying that in order to be loved, you have to be abusive to people. And that's really sad that you believe that. And uh, the truth is, is that there are women out there who will love you for who you are. There are men out there who will love women for who they are, and whatever your sexual orientation. There are people who will love you for who you are. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to do anything. They will see what's best in you and they will bring out what's best in you because they enjoy seeing you prosper. They know how to love unconditionally. And um, if you haven't experienced that, that is a common experience of somebody who's codependent. So I feel sorry for you. I, I, I'm, you know, I imagine whatever society you live in or where you live, you have been trained to be either a narcissist. Maybe if you're not a narcissist, your codependence is to pretend to be one. And how sad is that? It means that you have resigned yourself to never, ever be truly loved for who you are, which is a very empty, sad existence. So I don't recommend that. So again, nobody shows up on this channel unless they're a borderline or a codependent. You watch three of my videos at least and left three comments on three videos. You can tell me that you're a codependent until you're blue in the face, but the rest of us know you are. The rest of us know that behind that false facade of I'm perfect and I'm strong and I don't have any weakness and I never, underneath that is a sad little boy who's crying and desperate, so desperate to be seen and loved, but it's so frightening to you that you can't tolerate that, so you put up that narcissistic wall. It makes you sound like a narcissist, doesn't it? It's okay because there are codependents that pretend to be narcissists. Um, but you are going to be the most tasty morsel for the borderline because they will know, they will be very attracted to that false narcissistic facade that you present. They will be very attracted to that and they will make it their mission to get to your soft, juicy core. In the beginning, they will love bomb you and they honestly believe that once they get to your, your true feelings and your loving feelings, that then they'll be safe. They don't know that what will happen is that once they do, which they will, they will break that facade and they will get you to fall in love with them. Once they do, they will turn around and destroy you. And then you will show up on my channel and pretend that that never happened. But we all know that it did. So my suggestion is do the four things if you want to heal. If not... Please enjoy that merry-go-round for as long as you'd like. All right, that's it for me. Sweeping away some cobwebs. Uh, do the four things and heal. Otherwise, I have no sympathy for you. And um, that's it. I wish you guys all the best. And uh, I'll see you next time uh, after a few cobwebs uh, start piling up on the channel. Okay, see you later.